how is it possible that in an age where everybody's talking about possibility of food shortages, of uh, insecure supply chains, the Dutch government is pursuing this policy which will, which will lead to even, even more dependency on international supply chains and thus uncertainty for the Dutch consumers. Uh, the answer is that they, the, the, the people governing this country, are following the script written by the EU to realize what they call a great reset. They want to make us more dependent on international supply chains. They want to weaken Dutch sovereignty and autonomy. And also, they want to continue mass immigration into the Netherlands. And if you are going to bring more people to the Netherlands in a very small and densely populated country, you're going to need to take the land from the farmers and put houses there. That's the agenda, to, to turn the Netherlands into a giant city without its own means of production, without its autonomy in terms of sovereignty, but also in terms of food production, and to make people dependent on the international rulers, the globalists who are trying to take over. So, so that, that was one question I had, which, which is that you, you have this, the surface level reason is the nitrogen. To, to shut down all these farms. But then the solution would be to essentially, sh li quite literally, shut down so many farms that export billions of dollars worth of food, right? You're the number, five, uh, number six exporter in the world. So to me, that was always shocking. How could the solution be to shut down half the farms? And a lot of the f people I spoke with, they said they're not even being involved in the conversation. They're not being brought to the table to work out a solution. But you're saying that potentially it's because the politicians don't want to fix, they, they, yeah. they don't want a solution. It, this is just the reason that they're giving to actually implement something else. Exactly. And I'll, I'll give you a very quick update on the whole nitrogen and how it came to pass. Because in the 1990s, the European Union introduced the Natura, so that's Nature, 2000 guidelines. And that means that certain areas in Europe were, were picked for the preservation of certain forms of vegetation. And as it happened, the Netherlands uh, was picked to protect um, moss and clover and some other form of hay and other form of uh, vegetation that do well in relatively poor uh, surfaces, where we, there are not, not too many uh, things for, for plants to eat. And, and um, so nitrogen in itself, more nitrogen oxide in the Netherlands would not be a problem for nature. It would be a problem for maintaining the specific vegetation goals that were set in the Natura 2000 guidelines. And the politicians here are unwilling to do the most simple thing that anyone protecting the Dutch national interests would do, which is write a letter to the EU. Hello EU, we are no longer going to uphold these stupid guidelines. There's enough clover and moss elsewhere in Europe we are going to protect our farmers and we're going to have more trees and other forms of vegetation, which would be a consequence of a bit higher level of nitrogen oxide. That would be the logical thing to do. They're not doing that. They're sticking to these bureaucratic rules that 20 years ago someone said that the Netherlands had to maintain a certain percentage of moss and clover and hay. And uh, indeed, the real agenda behind that is that they, they want to have a stick to beat the farmers with. And, and it's not just to facilitate the continuous immigration. There's also a perhaps spiritual or deeper thing that is looming behind this, which is that farmers and in general people living on the land and of the land and with the land, they have a strong connection to the history they are proud of their often family companies who have, that have been in the family for, for, for several generations. And so these are not post-modern, post-historical, post-national people. They are proud family people who have their own business, who live off their own land, who have a connection to the history and to the nature of this country. And so they form a direct threat to the globalists post-territorial, post-identitarian agenda. The real point here is the Great Reset, mass migration, transnational governance, and that's why people have to become 
atomized. They have to lose their connection to the land, and that's why they're hitting on the farmers. You said earlier that one of the reasons that they're implementing this plan is to create more housing throughout the country for more mass migration. Exactly. Is that a stated goal, or is that just going to be the effect, and you think that's their underlying uh, intention? No, uh, it's not a stated goal in terms of uh, part of the same government agenda. They are they're, they're doing this as, a, as, a, as if it's an isolated phenomenon, but it is a stated uh, purpose, a stated goal of this government to continue mass migration. And also our current Minister of Housing has uh, been with a camera uh, around the country pointing at farmlands and saying, this is where we're going to put people in the future. So if you put one and one together, it's, it's very obvious that this is part of the agenda, but it's not that they would formally say we're now expropriating the farmers in order to buy housing. They're smart enough not to say it like that, that loud. But anyone who, who is clever and put, puts the, connects the dots will realize that this is, the, this, this, is, this is the plan. All right, the sponsor of today's episode is a phenomenal company called AMAC. That's A-M-A-C, and it stands for the Association of Mature American Citizens. They are quite literally one of the fastest growing conservative organizations in all of America, and you should consider joining for three main reasons. The first is the money saving benefit, because as a member of AMAC, you get access to a ton of discounts at many different verticals. Things like vitamin stores, restaurants, retail shops, and so on and so forth. If you want to check out the full list, it's pretty exhaustive, you can do so over on AMAC's website. The second benefit is that you get exclusive access to the AMAC magazine. It'll be delivered directly to your doorstep and it contains phenomenal coverage as well as deep analysis. And then the third benefit, the one that people say is their favorite, is that AMAC fights for your values over on Capitol Hill. In fact, you can check out the online version of this on their website. It's the AMAC Action Advocacy Annual Report and it shows exactly what they're doing on Capitol Hill in terms of fighting what they call the socialist storm that's brewing in this country. So head on over to amad.us forward slash facts matter and sign up today. I'll also throw a link down in the description box below. Because you're in parliament, right? So you're around these people, you understand their thinking. Do they have any, even even thinking towards the economy and towards the actual livelihoods of the people who are going to be affected by this? Because it's not only the farmers, right? If a farmer needs to suddenly sell half of his livestock, and if every farmer needs to do that, then the price of livestock crashes. You, who, who are you going to sell a cow to when everyone is selling a cow? But then oh, how about all the cheesemaker, all the truckers, all the people who are going to be affected by this? Is that an actual discussion here within the halls of parliament? No. no the, the question is very good because um, this is what I've been puzzled by ever since I became a member of parliament, which it was in 2017. These people, and I think this is true for most politicians in the West, They are micromanagers. So they can only think really uh, about one tiny little aspect of a a larger agenda. And and so what's happening here in Parliament is we have all these these discussions and debates about one specific aspect, for example, the nitrogen stuff, or how, what price are the farmers going to get for for giving up their land and, and, and so on. But nobody's talking about hey, what does this mean in the long run for the options for, to have our own cheese, to have our own meat in the supermarket? What if, if, if we, we really want to continue this mass immigration and our population is going to grow? I'm, a, I'm opposed to that, but that's what they want. How is that going to affect the, um, uh, the, the nitrogen emissions in general? Because that's, that's another complete illogical thing of their agenda. They, they say they want to reduce nitrogen oxide emissions, but... If you bring in 100,000 people a year net, then your nitrogen oxide emissions are going to increase anyway. So nobody's making these larger analysis of what, what's going to happen to the economy in the longer run, how, how are our policies internally consistent with one another. Uh, it's, it's one of the great tragedies, I find, of democratic politics uh, that um, yeah, the, these are very small, narrow-minded people and of course, the larger agenda, the globalists' agenda, there are people who are thinking about it and are seeing how all these things are useful and come into play one, and, one, one and, and the other. But unfortunately, I'm afraid there are a lot of uh, really stupid people here who, who just can't see how disastrous their policies are. So, so you, I mean, your last comment was pretty pessimistic. So 
with all the protests going on right now with the, fi the farmers being joined by the truckers, being joined by the fishermen, you don't think they're going to have a, an effect here in Parliament? There is one possibility. I've also said this uh, on the Internet and on social media. If they set up a strike, a general strike, where they won't deliver us any fish anymore, they won't deliver us any meat anymore, any milk anymore. They won't sell their cheeses to supermarkets anymore. If they genuinely say, okay, this is enough, stop, this is our existential battle, then in about two or three days, you're going to see it in the supermarkets. And people are going to be like, I'm hungry. Where is my food coming from? But this can only work if the farmers and the fishermen and all the people, and perhaps even internationally, they, they really form a coalition and stick to it. And we would support it. But I'm afraid that uh, what will happen is more like aggressive demonstrations, and then the public opinion will turn against them, and that government will just top up its offers and give them a little bit more money, and some people will say, and they will break the unity of the protesters, and some people will say, well, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take my share and I'll start something else, or I'll send my kids to college, or whatever. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic, I'm pretty, pretty afraid that they will, on the one hand, lose the public support by demonstrating too roughly instead of simply not delivering any food anymore, going on strike, and secondly, that many of them will choose their short-term self-interest rather than the long-term interest of the nation as a whole. So the, the last thing I wanted to ask you was that right now a lot of people across the, the, the world, definitely in the U.S., are suddenly ha have their eyes fixated on the Netherlands, right? Everybody's focused here. Uh, every time I check my feed, it's about the Netherlands, the food crisis in the Netherlands, the farmers. And I think one of the reasons is because even though this is localized here and this is your local parliament, you have similar policies kind of being pushed throughout the world. In the U.S., you have the Green New Deal, which also has a bunch of emission standards. Cow farts were in it uh, in, in the first yeah. draft, at least. So what would you tell to the people watching this around the world in different countries as they're watching what's happening in the Netherlands? What would you tell them potentially to watch out for in the future? We are in this fight together. Uh, we saw it during the COVID scam for two years. The same monstrous policies were imposed on us in all of our nations. We've seen it with the mass migration. All our peoples are being diluted by the systematic influx of people from entirely different ethnicities and cultures and religions and so on, parts of the world. We are now being disowned from our own creation of our, the production of our own food and our connection with our lands. Across the board, a radical agenda is being pushed, which is called the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which is all the climate hysteria of which scientifically it's bonkers. It's just there's, there is no CO2 problem, but they're creating this, uh, this, this madness about it. And ultimately you're going to see that a, a very small group of people who own almost everything will be richer and richer and more and more in control of our lives and we will be weaker and more lonely and atomized, poorer, without democracy, without, without proper ways to express ourselves because of also the censorship that we see on the Internet. The, if you zoom out, you see this trend towards bureaucratic dictatorship that is being imposed on all of us. And only if we unite and if we surpass all these differences that have divided us for so many years, and we fight this together, can we succeed? And, and, and we must do it. It's the, it's the single most existential fight in the history of civilization. We're doing it now, and they want to be ready in 2030. That's the year they set for their goals to, to have been achieved, the globalist takeover. So we have eight years to fight this. Let's do it together. Terry, thank you so much. Thank you.